And in the next 60 minutes here on Newsnight, Attorney General face off with lawyers for minority leader as he objects to attempts to tender in evidence secretly recorded call between himself and a third accused person, Richard Jackba, in ambulance trial. AG was not heard on that tape suggesting that the third accused person should implicate the first accused. So that is settled. How can this defense of bad faith avail the accused persons? Also tonight we'll be in Parliament where the Speaker and the majority of both call for collaboration in the House as they resume sitting today as the minority threatens to boycott parliamentary business with more than 24 bills and 11 statutory reports to be considered. You don't have to be uh, a magician. He cannot be at court and at the same time perform his duties as this. This is exactly what we are talking about. There's absolutely no reason why these hearings cannot be scheduled. Nobody is saying he won't go to court. Plus, we have details on impending shake-up in Parliament. An intelligence committee, which would be separate in form and shape compared to the previous committee of interior and defense. Even finance committee is going, we're now going to have the finance committee and economy committee. Also tonight, residents of Bole in Savannah region impose curfew on themselves as a string of killings terrorize the community, sparking widespread fear and anxiety. Who would like to be the next person to me? And then that's why the whole town, after 8, 8.30, the movement has ceased. Because of that, we just impose self curfew on ourselves. And later, uh, here on News Night on the NSMQ train, after a decade of failed attempts, Accra Girls Senior High School has finally emerged as winners in the National Science and Mass Queers Regional Competition. And it's very hot, outrageous, and for that matter, we have won this what, battle, and no matter how gigantic or huge you are, we can exceed your potentials. And in business, Ghana's inflation to end 2024 at 20.9%. We have details from the 2024 African Development Bank Economic Outlook. And in sports, we hear from Black Stars head coach Etoado, who is calling on Ghanaians to be patient with the Black Stars young players as they will need time to harmonize and work together. And I'll take your views and comments all here on News 9055111997. To tender in evidence, a secretly recorded call between himself and a third accused person, Richard Jackba, in the ambulance trial. My colleague, uh, Latif Idrisu, is with me in the studio uh, with more on this. It, it must have been a sight to behold, indeed, Latif, and called to see the attorney general himself accused of a lot of things in the last two weeks. Uh, make a case why the court should not admit this uh, recording in evidence. Yeah, and so let's begin with the fact that today the attorney general uh, was not in court uh, to listen to the audio tape uh, between himself and Richard Jackpa. Uh, he was represented by the deputy attorney general and other representatives from the court. Uh, the AG seek to object to an application by lawyers for Dr. Casey Lato Forsen, who wanted to or want to turn into evidence the audio recording between Richard Jackpa and Godfred Yebua Damin. If you recall, last week the court had made a ruling on the audio recording, but it was specifically with regards to the mistrial application filed by uh, Dr. Casey Lato Forsen and Richard Jackpa. So the judge had admitted into evidence the audio recording, but it was purposely to cure the mistrial application filed by uh, Richard Jackpa and Casey Lato Forsen. And so it was admitted into evidence. Today, they seek to re-enter the same audio recording into evidence. This time, they want it to be part of the substance of the ongoing trial, which has to do with uh, Dr. Casey Lato Forsen willfully causing financial loss to the state. The argument of Aziz Bamba is that the audio, in the audio you would hear Richard Jackpa and Godfrey Damon talking about the LC when the LC was supposed to have been issued and also the contract between the government of Ghana and Big C, which uh, Richard Jackpa we know is an agent. So that was the basis for which the lawyers for Dr. Kisilatu Forsen sought to put into evidence the audio recording. The Attorney General disputed that 
and asked the court to reject that application by Dr. Kishla to Forsen's lawyer. Because according to the Attorney General, uh, the lawyers have failed to lay down the necessary foundation for which purpose this audio recording would be admitted into evidence and going forward to form part of the substantive issue that is sitting before the court. That is one. They also mentioned that the audio recording in itself had breached the right to privacy, that right of the Attorney General, and so the court should not take that into evidence. On his part, Aziz Bamba made the argument that that uh, statement by the um, lawyers for or the Attorney General is, is frivolous and so wanted the court to, to disregard that. After the trial or the hearing today, we engaged the Deputy Attorney General who said that the court is already clear when it comes to this audio and that in the ruling with regards to the mistrial, the court settled the matter once and for all and so for the uh, lawyers to attempt to yet again tender it into evidence is nothing but red herring. That AG was not heard on that tape suggesting that the third accused person should implicate the first accused. So that is settled, sealed. And so today what, what they are seeking is to tender the same tape. So they will say, fine, if you want to tender, you, you must show that it is relevant to the issues we are going to contest in this matter. And that's why we demonstrated that it is not relevant so far as the determination of whether they are guilty or not guilty or the issues involved are concerned. So that's the difference. On his part, the community. And that there is Alfred Chia Yeboah, uh, who was obviously in court today. And we've seen a statement from the uh, minority side today, uh, a, a warning parliament that they will not actually be attending until they are done on a daily basis with what is happening in the court because your yeah, minority leader is being tried. Yeah, so, so that came up strongly in open court. Uh, after the objection and counter objection by the prosecution and lawyers for uh, Dr. Casey Lato Forsen, the judge made reference to a letter she had received from counsel for Dr. Casey Lato Forsen to the effect that Dr. Forsen had to be in parliament today because as we know now, parliament has reconvened. So his lawyers, I mean Dr. Casey Lato Forsen's lawyers, had written to the sitting judge to inform her that Dr. Casey Lato Forsen has to be in parliament today because he's the leader of the minority in parliament. According to the judge, her only response to that letter, uh, which was sent to her by lawyers for Dr. Atuforsen, was that, quote and unquote, I will sit. So that was the response she gave to the letter that came from uh, lawyers for uh, Dr. Kisela Atuforsen. And so Dr. Atuforsen himself had to be in court today. So he was in court, supported by some members of the minority in parliament, uh, including Sam George, who I saw, and I think three other members of parliament from the minority side came there uh, to show their support to the minority leader. And, and this was happening on the day when parliament resumed. And we were expecting a lot to happen today, of course, laying the foundation for what was going to happen uh, in this particular session of parliament. But this became an issue in parliament itself as you know the minority uh, members some of them were in court you saw them there uh, my colleague james Aveji uh, was in parliament where this has been a subject for both the minority side and the majority side he joins me on the line right now and james the uh the minority chief whip was was very clear on this matter when you spoke to him was it not exactly evans he was specific that uh, they the minority from today, and they have set the precedent with today's sitting, would not take part in any proceedings on the ground of parliament any time the minority leader goes to court on the case at hand. In fact, this morning, they, uh, actually, the minority leader was supposed to address, uh, be part of leadership to address the media before the House seat, but he was absent. We were told he was in court. And just before midday, they called a press conference and made it known that uh, this is what it will be moving forward. We can listen to uh, Honorable Boja on uh, the reason, the exact reason why the attempt they have made that has been denied and why they think that this is the way to go. Of course, will only be available for the business of parliament after proceedings of the court have ended on the days scheduled for the hearing of the ongoing ambulance case trial.
you don't have to be a magician. He cannot be at court and at the same time perform his duties as this. This is exactly what we are talking about. There's absolutely no reason why these hearings cannot be scheduled. Nobody is saying he won't go to court. And you know that a number of times the leader has, uh, 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 we have followed him to court. It is only on the, the occasions that demand his presence to make the work of the house continue. And the trial judge will not accept this reasonable request. That is what we are talking about, parliamentary service board meeting. So we are talking about specific roles that the leader must play. And on record, we have always attended to business on the floor. So there's no question about us boycotting uh, our responsibilities as members of parliament. We have always carried out that. You'll notice that there are days he went to parliament, uh, he went to court, and even came back and sat at the front to do a uh, business. So that question is not even, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's not factual that uh, we have uh, boycotted any business. We are talking about a concern of a judge consistently denying reasonable request for the minority leader to perform his duties as the leader of the minority in parliament. And we think this is not right. And we'll get the minority to talk to, just to expand on this. And this is all happening on the day when Parliament resumed. It set the stage for what is promising to be a, another very controversial uh, sitting of the House uh, tomorrow. We are looking forward to that. Uh, James is still with me. James, did the majority side respond to this? Yes, Evans. Although he didn't mention that specifically, but in his address to the House, he mentioned that there needed to be uh, some unity among the two parties. He uh, made, in fact, he stated that they have almost 17 bills to look at in this session of parliament before they rise, and a, a lot of committee reports they needed to look at. And so the best way to go is for the two, parts, uh, two sides of the house to remain united to get this job done before they rise. And so although he wasn't specific mentioning this, uh, he made a point that there needed to be unity between the two parties to get the job done, Evans. Now, let's talk about Parliament itself. They resumed today, and uh, both sides have been talking. Uh, bring us up to speed on what, is, what, what happened today. Uh, as a minority, obviously been serving notice, they may be boycotting uh, the sittings today. Both leaders of the House have also been giving their own welcome addresses and urging collaboration nonetheless. Yes, Evan. So, uh, I mean, uh, when the House started sitting, uh, before they even started sitting, I was on the lookout to see whether the minority would be in the House, and they, uh, quite a number of them came. And in fact, when you do a head count, the minority members were even more than those on the majority. The minority leader, Kesala, to force him in his, uh, 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 I mean, in his address, uh, pointed out issues about the disturbances, the violence, uh, uh, we have witnessed at some registration centers across uh, the country during the EC's limited registration exercise and what happened at Ewutu Senya just this weekend where the uh, parliamentary candidate was arrested over some alleged possession of firearms, amongst others. These are the things he need. He wants the EC to be summoned to the, uh, uh, to the House to come and answer some questions on why uh, they would sit by for some of these things to uh, happen at their offices. These terrible decisions have just been repeated by the Electoral Commission in just ended, the in just ended voter registration, as well as the ongoing vote transfer exercise. So, Speaker, the Electoral Commission is making a, making a simple electoral process very cumbersome, frustrating, expensive, Mr. Speaker, burdensome. These developments do not inspire hope in our electoral process. Rather, they give people and some political parties cause to question the integrity of the processes ahead of the 2024 general election. It is therefore imperative for Parliament to call the Electoral Commission to order and to save the democracy that we have always protected. Mr. Speaker, the NDC Minority Caucus want to use this forum to demand an urgent committee of the whole meeting with the Electoral Commission and to iron out these concerns before, Mr. Speaker, it is too late. And he also has something to say about this 5G contract plus 
what he's talking now about uh, this cost of living crisis. Exactly, Evan. So on the 5G, you remember that last week the majority held a press conference addressing some of this issue. They limited, the majority at the time, limited uh, the discussion about the call of minority uh, calling for most bills to be brought to the floor of parliament. The majority limited that discussion to the SML deal, that they believe the deal is not an international deal and cannot come to the floor of parliament. Today, the minority brought the 5G deal into question. They say that looking at the nature of that deal, it needed to be brought to the floor of parliament uh, to be looked at. Then uh, uh, some other members of the minority, especially the MP for Bole, uh, uh, Honorable Yusuf Suleimana, raised the issue about some uh, youth employment agents, first youth employed with a youth employment agency, have in the past few months not received their salary and why government needed to step up to address those challenges in this dire economy. Interesting, Mr. Speaker. The president granted executive approval for the sweetheart deal on the 22nd of August 2023, barely one week after the company was incorporated on the 16th of August 2023. This arrangement, Mr. Speaker, are not transparent, was awarded without any competitive process whatsoever, and has not been subjected to parliamentary approval as required by Section 33 of the Public Financial Management Act, Act 921. 2016. While conservative estimates suggest that the government could have raised between $250 million to $500 million upfront, this government is giving our national asset away at a paltry $6.25 million and 1% annual revenue per annum over a period of 10 years on a work and pay basis. The NDC minority has therefore flagged this transaction, Mr. Speaker, for further scrutiny, and we urge the government to do what is right and present the document before us for us to do justice with it before the agreement is actually signed. In all honesty, the Chroma is shit. Times are very hard and Ghanaians are really suffering. Right, Honorable Speaker, I am curious. I want to ask what has happened to the billions of Ghana cities approved by this House for the government's so called flagship program, planting for food and jobs? Where is the food? And where are the jobs? Right, Honorable Speaker, where are they planting for? Are they planting for high food inflation or are they planting for joblessness? Mr. Speaker, we are back. And James, there's been a lot of talk about an impending shakeup at the committee level, particularly on the side of the uh, majority, but also the minority. But we got a bit of an insight into what might happen on the majority side today when the majority leader spoke to you. Yes, Evan. So that, uh, uh, according to the majority leader, is in accordance with the new uh, or, uh, standing orders of parliament that has been uh, in implementation since February this year. He said that the standing order enjoins them to reconstitute uh, some committees of the House at every, the beginning of every session, and that is exactly what they are going to do. He made mention of two key committees, Finance Committee as well as the Defense Committee, and especially the Finance Committee. What, uh, how many, I mean, he talks about the fact that it could be split into two and the reason behind why they have to be split into two. We used to have a committee of defense and interior. Now we're going to have an intelligence committee, which would be separate in form and shape compared to the previous committee of interior and defense, which combined everything. Now we're going to have a defense committee and even finance committee is going, we're now going to have the finance committee and economy committee and, and all. So these changes will require the, the realignment and then reconstitution of these committees. The essence of it is to help MPs focus on key subject areas and to also uh, prepare themselves for the task. 
And that there is the uh, majority leader uh, who has been addressing a press conference today. Uh, thankfully, we can uh, speak now to the deputy minority leader uh, who joins us right now, Imano Amako Fibwa. Uh, thank you, sir, for your time here on the news night. Talking about the changes that we are anticipating on the majority side when it comes to these committees. Is this the same on your side also, that we can also expect some changes at the committee level? Yeah, we've been working on the on these changes, and it is really naturally coming out of the new standing orders that have brought in new committees. Uh, necessary required that we restructure committee members, and so we are working on that. Yes. And today I saw a statement from the minority side about your leader, uh, Case Lato Forcing, and the, how that will affect uh, your commitment to the House, and that you would you would focus on his trial days when the case is called before you come to the House. Considering how urgent this uh, time is for Parliament, and considering that you are just six months away from being dissolved, that definitely is going to affect the parliamentary business, would it not? Well, let me let me say clearly that we, uh, in the minority side, believe that Honorable Atto Forsen is innocent of all of those charges. And we believe that the reason he's in court is because of his leadership role in really bringing out issues, whether it was the e-levy, whether it was the alarm he blew on the haircuts by government, and all the critical issues that he has brought. And we say that the Ghana is where we are with the economy and our financial mess uh, because of the mismanagement of this government. And we are very sure that at each stage, Honorable Atuforsen, as the ranking member on finance, led the way in doing that. And because of that, he has been a target. And that's why he's in court. In fact, the recent revelations uh, and the uh, reported att attempts by the Attorney General to really get uh, the third accused and to basically tow his line confirms our, our, our yeah. So it's very, very clear where, why Honorable Atu Force is in court. And having said that, um, the, the lawyers we know have tried to make sure that the judge was very clear that the Honorable Atu Force has constitutional responsibilities, especially, for example, on a day like today where he was required to uh, give a resumption speech, have interviews on, on how, what is at stake for Parliament. And they refused that by the, the High Court judge to basically allow him to do that and require that he had to be in Parliament. I mean, it would be unconscionable for members of the minority to pretend that this is fair on our leader and allow him to go to court alone. There's no way we would do that. And so what we stated is very clear. Every time he's going to court, we will join him in court, and we'll come back uh, to do the people's business after court, uh, like we did today. Uh, and so and that's what we'll do. From, from what I'm hearing from you, this uh, goes beyond solidarizing with him. This is your way of objecting to the court's decision to say that you have to be here when you're called. Now, I've this just is a explained to you that we, we, we do not believe that uh, uh, when a leader is mandated by the Constitution to perform those duties, he should be prevented to, uh, uh, from doing that. Uh, you know, we, 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 for example, when, we, when you hear in open court, the judge says he won't even take, uh, he, will, he will not take a letter from the speaker and that he will prefer the lawyers to basically plead on our two forces' behalf. And when they do, he turns them down under the circumstances I've described. We, we think that's really very unfortunate. But having said that, I won't even go into uh, the court matters. But what we know is that we are very convinced that he's an innocent man. He needs our support. And the reason he's in court is because of his firmness and, and the stance he took in leading this effort. And as a, a minority leader, we have a responsibility to make sure he knows that we understand the role he has played and we are behind him. We know he's innocent and he's going to come out innocent. Yeah, I mean, and that's why we saw that with him at all times yeah, I mean, when if, he goes to court. If, but if we'll it, come back and obviously you know that it's not every day that he'll be in court. But yeah. when he's in court, we'll be with him and then we'll come back to do the people's business. Yeah, you say you'll be with him, but we're in court today. Not all minority members were in court to solidarize with him. Many of them were nowhere near the court today. Oh, well, you know, you don't necessarily need to fit in that small room. We have so many of the members who were in the premise of parliament. Others were uh, around. And so 
I think it's a position we've taken, and we'll stick to it. And on the key issues that you expect to come before the House today, and one of them announced by the majority leader is that the education minister is going to come before the House with a, a bill uh, on the free SHS that uh, will the, the, the government's aim is to pass into law that will bind successive governments. Can they expect cooperation on the key issues that is expected to come before you, including the media budget review? Well, well, I would not comment on, on things that are not before us. Uh, I don't even know the details. This is something that the majority had proposed. So we'll wait to see what, what is before us. But with the people of Ghana can be sure. And as the minority leader stated, we are very committed to making sure that our responsibility to at all times protect the interests of the people of Ghana will be done. And and also, uh, it has been mooted by your side on the Attorney General that you'll be mo moving a, a motion of censure uh, on, on him. Are we going to see that play out now the Parliament has resumed? We are still working on uh, a lot of the things we do. We strongly believe that the Attorney General's behavior must be uh, punished. We believe that he was completely wrong in what he did and we will make sure that all the parliamentary tools available to members of parliament are brought to bear thank you very oh. much that day is emmanuel amakofi boy is a deputy minority leader there so live your news tonight is on joy 99.7 fm uh you want to join us with your thoughts 055 111 i'll be sharing that with the rest of the world right after business with james Ashen. hello james Evans coming up in business. Ghana's inflation to end 2024 at 20.9%. We have details from the 2024 African Development Bank Economic Outlook. And new report by the Third World Network Africa shows planting for food and jobs program not achieving its targeted result due to low credit opportunities. Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTM Business. Welcome to the new world of business. Kingdom Books and Stationery, Syntex Tanks and Pepsi and Charcoal and Herbal. Welcome back to Business News on News tonight. I am James Shen. First of Ghana's inflation is expected to end 2024 at 20.9% versus a closure by the African Development Bank captured in its 2024 African economic outlook. There is more in First Business Desk report. The report revealed that the youth unemployment in the country was rising. It's therefore called for reinforcement of Ghana's structural transformation needs. Productivity has stagnated in services, the dominant employment sector, and is rising only slowly in industry and agriculture. Again, agriculture's employment share declined from 53.9% in 2007 to 29.8% in 2019, while industry share rose from 14.1% to 21%. The services share also rose from 31.9% to 49.2% over the same period. To fast-track the structural transformation, the report said Ghana must enhance its competitiveness by easing infrastructure bottlenecks, accelerate agro-industrialization by strengthening skills development, value addition, and private sector development. Additionally, it must create a policy framework for technology adoption and innovation. And that was a business desk report. The World Bank's latest global economic prospects report has revealed that global economy is expected to stabilize for the first time in three years in 2024. According to the World Bank, global growth is, is projected to hold steady at 2.6% in 2024 before edging up to an average 2.7% in 2025 to 2026. That is well below the 3.1% average in the decade before COVID-19. The forecast implies that over the course of 2024 to 2026, countries that collectively account for more than 80% of the world's population and global GDP will still be growing more slowly than they did in the decade before COVID-19. Overall, developing economies are projected to grow 4% on average over 2024 to 2025, slightly slower than in 2023. Now let's do some other stories. And the di multi-dimensional poverty index report from the Ghana Statistical Service has revealed that the Greater Accra region recorded lowest incidence of a poverty rate of 11.7%. The Savannah region recorded the highest with 49.5%. The incidence of poverty refers to the percentage of people who are multi-dimensionally poor. This affects 
This affects areas such as health, education, and employment status of people. In an interview with Joy Business Government Statistician Professor Samuel Kobnade Enim attributed the disparity to differences in development across areas such as education, health, and living conditions. You would find pockets of areas within the region that are not performing well. What we really want to do with this is even go beyond the regional ports, which is giving us the performance of e-district, and narrow down on e-district and see the locality level variations that we have. So, and we are pretty sure that we're going to see also intra-district as we see in intra-regional disparities when it comes to multi-dimensional poverty. Professor Samuel Kobnenim is the government statistician at the Ghana Statistical Service. Now, a report by the Fed World Network Africa on the impact of the planting for food and jobs on one district, one factory to the structural economic transformation of Ghana has shown that low credit opportunities and lack of effective targeting are major challenges facing the program. According to the lead researcher, Dr. Faustin Obin, the lack of targeted credit support deprived many smallholder farmers from full participation in the program, affecting output. Dr. Obin out line the findings at a workshop organized by the Fed World Metric. Because over the years the cost of the inputs of the PFJ increased, we saw that many small-scale farmers who could not access the inputs without some credits could no longer use the package. The package is an improved seeds with a fertilizer but also with extension support. For many of these improved seeds they are heavily dependent on fertilizers because they suck a lot of nutrients and so without being able to afford the fertilizer, even if you afforded the seeds, your productivity would not likely increase. We all see what the slight increase in import bills meant for fertilizers within the PFJ. So we need to have a long-term plan, um, improving productivity with locally available materials and only supplementing it with a slight fertilizer or mineral fertilization that we can afford. And that's a leading researcher at the Fed World Network, Dr. Faustina. Obin. And that's all for Business News on Newsnight with me, James. Hishen, over to you, Evans. Uh, James, thank you very much. You're still live your news tonight. It's on Joy 99.7 uh, FM. And I will be sharing your thoughts with the rest of the world pretty shortly uh, here on news night. 055 A few of your messages already on the stories you've heard so far, uh, right from top story till now. Uh, and this one on the uh, subject of the free SHS and uh, ISA says a forthcoming free SHS, uh, free SHS legislation should mandate the government to allocate sufficient funds to support the program and also require the Akufado Dr. Baumia administration to settle all outstanding payments all the schools since the 2020-2021 academic year up to the present time. Uh, that's his view on that particular subject. Uh, also, uh, on the subject of the ongoing uh, protests and the strike that we've seen uh, undertaken by workers at the NIA, uh, this one from uh, Asokwa uh, Collings it says, Evans, today I, I sent my nephew to one of the NIA offices in Kumasi to register uh, his Ghana card, but all the offices I visited were closed. We knew the card for urgent application, but we couldn't get any place to register. Well, it's because the NIA staff, uh, they've called a nationwide strike, which is beginning to bite. Nana Ekwa in Ablikuma Central says the minority in parliament can go and sleep in court even before Ato Fawson gets to court. The constituents who voted for them will show them <coughs> the exit come December 7th is his view there. It's a live your news night. It's on Joy 99.7 uh, FM. I want to take you to the Shanta Regional Capital, Kumasi. Now, where the Ghana Medical Association have today been making a strong case to the vice president and the flag bearer of the MPP for an urgent intervention to save Ghana's second largest referral health facility, the Konfanoche Teaching Hospital. Now, the GMA says your members have been compelled to treat patients in chairs following years of neglect and congestion. Now, the recent project launched by Asante Henny to raise $10 million to renovate portions of the hospital is yet to really see any real progress. Now, sharing their frustration when the vice president met professional groups in the Ashanti regional capital, uh, the head of the association, the GMA there, Dr. Park Kwesibaru, said there is a need for government to expand the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital to absorb the pressure and improve health care. For the first time, thank you to our CEO, usually what they did was to hide the mess at the emergency because of overcrowding and the reason being that almost 
Conforachi takes care of so many of the regions, six, seven, eight regions in the country, 12 regions in the country. We, and I'm sure they saw, and they will collaborate what we saw, and I'm sure some of them felt so nauseating. Some threw up, and they will confess to you. And that is the environment as health workers we find ourselves. We talk of Agenda 111, and my former chief executive is here. We've had our debates, um, Dr. Nsiansari. Of all the Agenda 111 you are building in the 12 region, Confanoche still will serve as the referral center to them. The people who will be voting for you are not just those here. They are the patients who are sitting in chairs for two days. We have two hospitals that are complete or almost complete, and they have facilities which Confanoche, which is the major referral facility, at the Confanoche Teaching Hospital, Dr. Yao Opari Labi uh, joins us via phone right now. Doc, thanks for your time here on Newsnight. Thank you very much, Evans, for having me, and good evening, good evening to all our listeners. Uh, I just had there the GMA uh, rep there make the point about the state of the Confanoche Teaching Hospital. There was an opportunity today to put this before the vice president. What did you hear from him today uh, when these issues were laid bare before him? Pardon? Can, can you repeat that can question? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Labi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Were you in a briefing with the vice president today? No, I wasn't there today. I was at, I was at work. Talking about the challenges, today the GMA uh, reps got an opportunity to talk about the Confanoche challenge. And they talk about the congestion. And uh, we've heard that quite often. Uh, as far as the facility is concerned, the uh, tune for himself has had to intervene, raising some funds uh, to assist. Has anything changed? Have you seen an improvement? Or is it worse than before? Where are you tonight on this matter? Right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, um, the, the hospital, um, as, as, you, as you mentioned, is receiving, is receiving um, some attention because of the um, earlier on some months some month ago when our chief executive um, showcased what was happening in Confanochi. So um, the project, the Hill Confanochi project has started. However, you know, it's, we are starting with construction in the A block. So what we are doing now is construction. So new, new spaces have not been created yet. So uh, we haven't expanded our capacity. Actually, this project is not meant to expand capacity. It's actually meant to improve on the infrastructure and then the equipment in the hospital. It's not actually meant to um, expand the facility. So it's actually focusing on what we call the G block. The G block is the traditional, I mean, the, the A to D block that you, you see when you come to Kong Kong Furniture. And I gather that your main concern then is the restricted uh, facilities that you have. Do you have, we've heard about the congestion. How bad is it? Uh, the con congestion is quite bad. It's very bad. Um, I, I have some statistics here. Uh, you know, um, majority of our patients come into the hospital through the accident and emergency center. Now, um, it's been divided into three main portions. We have, uh, uh, depending on uh, on the, on the uh, what we call triaging, when we assess the patients, <coughs> we move them into certain areas depending on how sick they are, and that will also depend on um, the kind of attention that should be given to them. Now, we have an area called Orange. The original capacity is 12. Today, we had 46 patients there. So it means that we have patients spread out from the ward into the opening, the open area, which is, I would say, is like the, the, the entrance lobby. Now, we have an area called red. Now, in red, we have very ill patients, the critically ill, some of whom are on ventilators and, uh, and have to be monitored. The original capacity is seven. We have 13 patients there now. Now, when you come to yellow, original capacity is 18, and today we have 26 patients there and now we also have patients who are waiting who have been seen by doctors and are waiting to be sent to the wards 
So, for instance, on last Thursday, we had 47 patients who were waiting for beds on the ward. So they were in the emergency department, which normally sees patients, stabilizes them, and then and facilitates their transfer to, to wards for their, for, for, to continue their management, depending on their diagnosis. And then we have 47, we had 47 of them waiting for beds. So that is how bad the congestion is. Talking about congestion, the vice president had an opportunity to address it when the GMA reps put it to him. This is what he had to say. The overcrowding that we are seeing at Konfuanochi uh, Teaching Hospital, and which is really under pressure, being a referral hospital for 12 regions, and has made some suggestions which we should take very seriously dedicating resources for retooling uh, the Konfuanochu Teaching Hospital. I am in agreement, agreement with that. I think that if we want a Konfuanochu Teaching Hospital to perform, it cannot perform without those resources. And I think that you've made particular reference to two hospitals that are almost done. Sevilla, which is a regional hospital, and Afari Hospital, which is a military hospital. I think that we expect Sevilla to be com commissioned. I think hopefully by next month, July, and by August, commission Afari as well. How much of a difference would it make uh, to you at Confanoche if you have Sevilla and a military hospital up and running? Hello. It, it will make a very big difference. See, in, in Kumasi, Konfanochi is the only tertiary facility serving Ashanti region and 11 other regions. So 12 out of the regions of Ghana refer cases to us. The other, not too long ago, we had a patient refer to us from uh, Boli Bamboy, and that was 367 kilometers because the patient needed tertiary care. Now, if we have Serua and the military hospital coming on board, and they are tertiary facilities, then because Confanochi gets a lot of complicated cases, because we are tertiary facilities, so we get a lot of complicated cases, which is not surprising, referred to us. They can take off some of the load because once we reduce the congestion, then the quality of care also improves as we speak. Because of the congestion, even the space, the space that could be used to treat um, the very ill are being occupied by patients who could have been managed in other facilities. Now, let me give you some statistics. In 2023 and in 2022, the number of visits that the National Ambulance Service made to Pomfanochi Teaching Hospital were more than the total number of trips they made to 37 military hospitals, Kolebu Teaching Hospital, and the Ridge Hospital put together. And I haven't even mentioned patients who are coming in private ambulances and are coming in private cars. When you talk about Kolebu, Kolebu has support, a lot of support in Accra. There are other tertiary institutions in Accra. We don't have that in Kumasi. So if Seua and the military hospital come on board, and we hope that should be soon, then, then we, it will really reduce the pressure on us and, and it will improve the quality of care. Okay. Uh, and I also want to bring in very quickly uh, Dr. Nsia Sari, who's a presidential advisor on health, who also joins us. He also traveled with the vice president. Doc, uh, very, very briefly, we, we also heard from the deputy head of the uh, Confanochi Teaching Hospital, the deputy director there, tell us that one of the things they also need desperately is an expansion in this facility. When will Confanochi itself get that investment to expand its facilities currently? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if I, I'm sure you are aware, I was the longest. Uh, I'm the longest serving uh, chief executive of Confanochi. I served there for eight and a half years, so I know Confanochi very, very, very well. What Dr. Yalabi is saying is very true. You know, I used to say when I was in Confanochi that Confanochi is a teaching hospital, it's a regional hospital, 
it's a district or metropolitan hospital that time, as well as uh, maybe a health center, because we have a polyclinic there. So every patient within Ashanti region, within Kumasi Metropolis, within the neighboring regions, all come there. That's why I say that about 12 regions use Comfort as a referral. Because any case which cannot be handled in the middle belt and also the northern belt are all referred to And he's given it the statistics. It's just in the interest of time, if you don't mind, it's just giving us a sense of where they can get the, when they can get the investment. Yes. To the investment, if, I'm sure you are aware, that uh, Confanoche uh, at the moment, there is a maternity and children's block which is ongoing there at the moment. Unfortunately, the uh, one which was started by Champon, which was revamped or re- restarted again by His Excellency President Kofo, um, there was something happened and I understand it was pulled down. But today, I passed there. The maternity and children's ward, which is being done, is now, I think, on the fifth floor. Very soon, when the contractors come back to the work again after the restructuring of the uh, death restructuring, I'm very sure that they will complete it as quickly as possible. But the most important thing is that now we are opening up hospitals or we are building a lot of hospitals in Ashanti region. And he's made the point that once you do that, particularly for the military hospital in Syria, that will make a, a major difference uh, to the Confanoche scenario. Thank you very much. Just run out of time on this. This is definitely the subject that if you live in Ashanti region is very important to you and this is something that we'll return to in some greater depth.